Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Pathfinder study for this week. We are going to begin a study in the letter of Jude, or the book of Jude, as many refer to it, uh, following 3rd John. We just finished uh, the study in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. thought it might be good for us to move on now into the book of Jude, this letter, this short letter. Uh, before we do, let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for this time that we have together in this manner, that we can join hearts and minds, that we can open the word that you have given us together, that we can contemplate it, meditate upon it, pray over it, Father, and be blessed by you through your word to us. May your spirit who preserved it uh, really speak to us today through this word. Uh, thank you, Father, for your love, your grace, your mercy. Be with those who are needing your tender healing touch today, who need your comfort, who need, Father, just the, the knowledge of your presence and the assurance of your love. Thank you for Jesus, in whose name we pray, and amen. Amen. Again, in the book of Jude, or, or this letter, uh, we're going to just be looking at just the opening verses today. That there's, there's a lot here in just the opening verses. The author of this letter is believed to be the half-brother of Jesus. Um, and you may recall that he did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah until after the resurrection. He, he did not put his faith and trust in him. He didn't believe that his half-brother, Jesus, was the Christ. Neither did any of the rest of the siblings in the family. I'll have to say. You may recall that James, also the half-brother of Jesus, did not believe in him until after Jesus appeared to him when he raised from the dead. I believe personally from what I've been able to research that this was penned somewhere around the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, just either prior to AD 70 or, or maybe in the early days of, maybe even through it or, or immediately after, but in that time period. It begins in verse 1, saying, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. That's just the first two verses. Now, now if we're right that this is Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, there's something here that seems to indicate his humility to me. In this introduction. I mean, after all, someone might, in their flesh at least, be wanting to boast or brag about the fact that, well, you, you know Jesus? Well, guess what? I, I knew Jesus. I grew up with Jesus. Someone might be tempted to do that. I know him better than you do. You know, I saw things that, that you never saw about him. I, I knew him when he was just a kid. <laughs> but he didn't do any of that. Didn't do any of that. Matter of fact, he calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ. Now, he identifies himself as a brother of James, so he's, he is identifying himself with the family, but that's not what he's saying is the most precious or prominent thing about his relationship with Jesus. Not, not the blood that flowed through his veins, but the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross that, again, identified him as the Savior of the world and then when he rose again as the Lord of the earth and so Jude says I'm his servant I'm his servant might not have recognized or realized who he was uh, you know earlier on but but I do now I do now and, and I submit to him I am his servant uh, the word here in some translations is a slave or bond servant the idea that I really submit myself to him it's Lord of my life. Could we say that about our relationship with Jesus? I, I, I would hope so, that we could. That we could. Now, I would think that, that Jude um, may have taken some, uh, well, abuse at times from people who would say to him, if they did know, you know, and understand immediately who he was and what his relationship with Jesus in the flesh had been, might have ridiculed him for not believing earlier. There might have been those as well who would tend to treat him special, you know, think, wow, th this, was, this was the brother of Jesus, and, and exalt him to a position that, 
Well, he didn't deserve just because of his position in the flesh that he had in the family. So I see real humility here. And I recognize that there are people who would be, you know, on both sides of the uh, spectrum as far as their perception about him because he was a half-brother to Jesus. Now, this letter is obviously addressed to believers, isn't it? I mean, it's written to believers, to Christ followers, to those who are born again. That, that's who he's writing to. He identifies them, not with those terms, but in terms that should really, uh, you know, convince us, you know, that that's who he's writing to. Now, though there's some differences in the wording of major translations, uh, there are at least three deep truths in this very first verse, in the latter part of it, that I, I want you to get, I don't want you to miss. Notice, first he writes to those who have been called. That's what he says. He writes to those who have been called. Called by who? Well, by their father. How? Through the Holy Spirit. As we talked about earlier in uh, John's letters, the idea of being called even through the gospel, through the preaching, through the presentation of the gospel. The Apostle Paul would say to the Thessalonians, that's, that's how they were called, you know, by the preaching of the gospel, the message about Jesus Christ. That's, that's how God extended the call to them to come to himself. So they were called by God, by God. The idea that we might be called even by name by God, that God would know us even before the foundation of the world and know us and, and call us to himself, even knowing all that the, he does about us, still calling us to himself, being called out of a dominion of darkness, the Apostle Paul has said in Colossians, into a dominion or a, a domain of light. So calls us for the gospel, God the Father calling us to the gospel by the message of the Holy Spirit as Jesus is, is taught. He also says these readers are loved by, or in this particular version, in God. Now, there's a subtlety there, once again, as I said, in whether or not that, uh, that word should be in or by. Most uh, translations do choose by, but it it's, could be either or. What's he referring to, though? that his readers are loved by God or loved in God, what would he be referring to? Well, certainly, you know, our first thought comes to my mind is, you know, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting or eternal life. God loved them. He loved these people. He, he loves all people. But the concept of loving them in God the Father is maybe a bit deeper than that. Not just he loved them, but he, he loves them as they continue in this relationship with him. That there's more of an intimacy, there's a deeper love, there's a deeper, again, uh, fellowship and communion that they have as they live in this love that the Father has lavished upon them. We talked about that also back in First John. So to be loved by God... And to be loved in God, in, in this relationship with him. You know, not just love that Jesus was sent, but that, that love continues as we walk in fellowship with him. That's just a neat, neat thing, isn't it? Also, finally, he says they are kept for Jesus. Some versions would say that they, uh, they are being preserved by Jesus. How would you explain this? What do you think that means, that they are being kept for Jesus? or preserved for Jesus, preserved by Jesus. What, what, well, some have certainly seen in here the idea of the perseverance of the saints, that if someone truly believes in Jesus, truly gives their life over to Jesus, continues to surrender, see, and commit, and live in that love of God, they're safe. They are secure. They are kept for Jesus to live with him forever in heaven, but kept for him in the now too. The idea of, again, being guided and, and, and protected and watched over, even as we live in the love of God today, being kept for Jesus, saved uh, from sin, saved for purpose, saved for good works, to do those things that would glorify God. 
and B, for the good of others. Wow, being kept for Jesus, kept for him, saved for him. We're his, we belong to him, we're his possessions. We're his followers, we're his servants, as Jude said earlier. Now, Jude wants his readers, these people who are, who are called and loved and kept, to have something in abundance, to have a good supply of something. What is it? Verse 2, mercy, peace, and love. May they be yours in abundance. How many of you need an abundance of mercy, peace, and love? How many of you desire that? How many of you want it? I certainly do. I, I believe we all need it, whether we recognize it or not. But mercy, peace, and love be ours in abundance. That was his prayer for them, that they would have mercy, peace, and love. But I believe there's something more here than just receiving of it. He wants for it to flow through us. May we have mercy. May we have peace in our hearts. May we show love to others. As it's given to us, may it flow through us again so that mercy, peace, and love abounds in our lives. So we have it in abundance. We've got more than enough to share for more than enough to, to if you will, flow through us and, and over into the lives of others to be, well, as I've said so many times before, as we're blessed to be blessings, blessings. Now, if you had to choose one of the things just in these first couple of verses that has the most profound effect upon you, what might it be? Would it be that you are called by God, that, that he called you, he, 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 I mean, reached out to you, he loved you first and continues to love you? Would that be it? Or would it be that you're being kept safe, kept for purpose, that, that God is using you and working through you day by day as we submit to him to do so. Isn't that something profound? And, and this idea, once again, that we have mercy, peace, and love in abundance. Two verses, but my goodness, what riches of knowledge, wisdom, what beautiful truths to encourage us on our journey as we follow Jesus. May we be servants of Jesus Christ. May we be not just recipients of the love and the mercy and the peace, but also those who extend it to others. Hey, God bless. We're going to pick up at verse 3 next week, Lord willing. Till then, take care.